first time at XOXO, so thank you. Um, all right, so, oh, also she and her, and I actually want to speak out that um, another good context for which the gender pronouns are important are when you have foreign names, like Chinese names or Nigerian names, when you're doing email. So in terms of normalizing it, um, I highly encourage it in all kinds of situations, not just for a gender binary situ situation, but for people who have names that are sometimes confusing. So I'm gonna tell the story of how I became an emoji activist. Um, first I wanna say, hello. This is when I text my friends in the morning and I wanna say I'm up, I'm like, hi, so this is me. I also wanna say that I've had a cough that sort of chased me across two continents at this point. So if I start coughing, don't worry, I will survive. I have water, I have cough drops, and we'll just let the awkward moment pass. So, um, so the first question I have for you is, who do you envy? Because it is a compass for what you care about, even if you don't realize it yourself. So when my friends are saying, what should I do with my life? I ask them, who do you envy? So about you know, a decade or so, I asked my boyfriend at the time um, who he envied, and he said, I, I envy my friends who are happily married. And I was like, oh, we're really different people. <laughs> Because I envy people who had impact on the world, like whether or not through ideas or through art or through starting a nonprofit or starting a company or th through being, um, you know, sort of a, a great leader. And I realized that like that left me a little bit different from some of my classmates because at that point in college, my, my at that point my college uh, classmates were all hoping for like New York Times wedding announcements, and I was dreaming of a, a New York Times like obituary. Um, <laughs> I do not want to pass frictionlessly through this world. And so, um, you know, at that time I was a journalist, I was a reporter at the New York Times, and I realized maybe it was time to stop being a journalist because I no longer envied those who had won large journalism awards. Instead, you know, I kind of cared about people who ended up on like creative lists, like the Fast Company creative list, or like, you know, other kinds of like 30 under 30, 50 under 50, whatever. So um, it was time, and so I, I uh, felt a calling to change publishing as it went digital, in, in part because so much, of the, so much of the business models were collapsing, so many of the business models were collapsing. So I wanted to find the business models that let writers write for a living, or to this audience, that let creators create for a living, because I think a society is poor when you, when you do not have the economic models to let people be creative. So I went to Silicon Valley um, and start, did a startup, raised money. Some of my investors are probably in the audience. I saw, I saw some of you there. And it turns out startups are really, really hard. Um, you go through a whole range of emotions. You know, it's sort of like sadness and anxiety and depression. Um, you know, definitely vomiting. I've vomited my share um, in terms of dealing with a startup. And it takes a really long time. And uh, it can be very lonely, and you feel very small, and often very irrelevant. Um, so it was hard, it is hard, um, less hard now, but it was very hard back then. But you, know, you feel a calling sometimes, and so I persevered. And sometimes you encounter uh, the unexpected. So, <laughs> So, um, in 2015, uh, a little bit, almost exactly three years ago, I was texting with my friend, this is Yi Ying Lu, who's a, who may be uh, famed for being the creator of the Twitter fail whale, and um, also a dumpling fan. So she and I were texting because I was cooking dumplings, and you know, I texted her a photo of these dumplings I made, and she's like, yum, 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 knife and fork, knife and fork, knife and fork, and then she's like, oh, Apple doesn't have a dumpling emoji. And I was like, er? Um, and I was like, okay, whatever. And then half an hour later, she texts me her uh, dumpling emoji that she just had drawn up. Because when you're a designer, you can just like do things like that. And, 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 um, and what you don't actually see in this image, because it's a screenshot, is the original version she sent me had like blinking red eyes. So she called it the bling bling dumpling. Um, and she's like, you know, I, I decided to fix this. And I was like, Jesus, how is there no dumpling emoji? Right, that's just like really strange because like emoji are originally Japanese, and there's lots of Japanese foods on 
the emoji keyboard. So there's ramen, there's bento boxes, there's curry, there's tempura. There are even like really kind of weird things, like things on a stick. There's a white and pink fish cake, in case you guys are wondering what that is. And there's even that triangle rice ball that's look, that looked like it's had a bikini wax, right? All, <laughs> all on the emoji keyboard but no dumpling. And like, that's really weird, right? Because you know, dumplings are sort of this universal food, very common around the world. Emoji are very common, they're kind of universal. So two universal things, no dumpling emoji. And I was like, dude, whatever system in place is broken, and I'm gonna go fix it. <laughs> and so I was like, I, I knew nothing about emoji, didn't really use emoji at that point. Um, and I like, you know, <laughs> but there's Google, and I was like, where do emoji come from? And essentially, they come from, they're regulated by this organization called the Unicode Consortium, which is a nonprofit organization based in Mountain View, California, that um, generally ha is dominated by large US multinational tech companies. So when I showed up, there were nine US multinational tech companies that were members, Oracle, IBM, Microsoft, all of the sort of usual suspects. Of the three that were not large US multinational tech companies, at that time, there's a German software company, SAP, the Chinese telecom company called Huawei, and then the government of Oman. So those, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> they pay $18,000 a year um, to have full voting rights on Unicode, which regulates things like emoji, among other things. But there's like this tiny little loophole, tiny or big, uh, which is that you can join for $75 a year as a non-voting member, as an individual. So that's what I did. I signed up on <laughs> the uh, website, you know, it was charged, and then you end up on their mailing list. And so, you know, on October 2015, um, you know, there was an email that was like, okay, our next plenary meeting is like, you know, in Cupertino, or Sunnyvale, I think it was Sunnyvale, um, who can come? And I looked at my calendar, I was gonna be in the Bay Area at that time, and I like wrote back and RSVP'd. So um, I just showed up, you know, took the Caltrain to Apple. And I don't know what I was thinking, like in terms of like who would be at like a Unicode plenary meeting. Like I think maybe it was like maybe a smaller version of this, you know, like just just like a people audience stage, people discussing and you know, the future of emoji, what should be emoji. Um, but instead this is what I got. So this was a um, conference room of about 20 people. Uh, mostly kind of mostly male, mostly white, mostly engineers um, in their 50s and 60s. They're kind of older because they've been working on this for uh, 25 years or so. So, so these are people who are kind of discussing and um, deciding your emoji. And it was really interesting. They're so excited to see me because like random people do not just RSVP and show up in Unicode meetings, right? <laughs> so, <laughs> so they were like oh, we're so glad to see you, tell us about yourself, what brings you here, and it like totally had the vibe of showing up at a new church for the first time, <laughs> you know? And so, so we've gotten to these meetings, right, which were like, okay, you know, milk, milk emoji, should it be a glass of milk? Or maybe it should be a carton of milk, but carton of milk is like kind of really American, so maybe it should be, a, you know, a jug of milk, and like, it was this whole like debate, you know, pancake, pancake or pancakes? Like one pancake, it could also be a crepe or a bing, in Chinese, or but if you have multiple, then you add butter. Then it's very American, and I was like, "This is not. This is this is not a good process <laughs> for how emoji should be decided." And these are not the people that should be curating a global visual languagey thing, right? So I decided. I was like, <laughs> so, so I was like, "All right." So me and Yiying started this group called Emoji Nation, and our motto is "Emoji by the people for the people." Um, and so, you know, just kind of like set out to like change emoji. And part of it, some of my friends, especially, um, I have a professor friend at Stanford who's like a big skeptic. He's like, like, why does it, like, why does it matter? Like, why are you devoting all of your time to these like cute little pictures? They're just glyphs. Especially like, I mean, like the most famous emojis are arguably the poop emoji. Like, like, how can you take something where poo is a celebrity uh, seriously? You know, and then there's a question or like emoji even a language, right? Um, and if you talk to linguists today, most of them actually say it is not a language. Emoji is not a language at this point, despite the fact that Oxford English Dictionary selected face, uh, was it, uh, face with uh, tears of joy as a word 
of the year. So not a language. And you know, sometimes I say it's like paralinguistic, sort of like language, or like proto-language, because they can do nouns decently, like noun things, object things. Their emoji are pretty decent at. They're kind of like pretty decent at action verbs. You know, like if you're going to pray or like do you know ski, like all kinds of sports. All the Olympic sports are there. Curling is there. Um, very strong on an emotional state, actually. Um, that's probably one of the areas. Like if you're like sad or depressed or anxious or whatever, emoji very good. Um, not good at abstract concepts. For example, like this thing. I don't know if you guys have seen this. This is like I'm a witness, uh, kind of made up by the. Um, the ad, ad council. So, and it's not good in non object nouns and not so good on non action verbs. So, um, the other area where they're very weak, where emoji is very weak at, is that it doesn't have the word I or you, right? So, most languages Chinese, Spanish, English, German, French, everything I kind of went through in school. One of the, f the first words you learn is I or you. So one linguist told me that she um, sees people struggling with the I, you concept. So they'll do arrows up and down. Um, and you know, it, it was just sort of an interesting thing to me. So then the other question is like, why do I care? Why does Jenny Lee, <laughs> who's like doing a startup, care so much about this? Well, I grew up speaking Chinese. In fact, it's my first language, which you can't tell, yeah. Um, you know, with mm, parents did a little flashcards with me when I was little. Then like came kindergarten and like you know whatever. All of English, English kind of surge. So I grew up with Chinese, and I like to say Chinese is original emoji language, right? So so <laughs> they drew pictures and eventually they became characters. So this is fire. Uh, this is mouth, like sort of O. Uh, this is tree. This is moon, and this is sun, right? So kind of like a lot of interesting parallels. We're actually working on a book called Hanmoji, which is like Chinese characters and emojis, kind of combining them. Um, and it's fun because you can mix and match them, right? So you know, here we have two trees, which basically means forests, right? Very logical. Here we bring the sun and the moon together, and curiously, it means bright. If the it should mean bright. Oops, oops. Let's go back a little bit. Let's go back to bright. Where is bright? Bright, bright. Then we can get interesting combinations. Like um, this is a roof with a pig underneath it. So you're like, oh, maybe that means farm or something, uh, or whatever. It actually means home or it means family. So like pigs, family, whatever you know, in-laws, whatever. So, um, so then that's a character for uh, you know family. So this is an interesting character. So this is a character for woman, Nu, and. Oh, very, very popular uh, radical in Chinese, used all the time. I don't know, like maybe the woman is like curtsying or so. Um, and you see in all kinds of contexts. So here, for example, is a roof with a woman. And you're like, oh, maybe that's like another character for family or another kind of character for home. Um, in fact, this character means peace. So things are at peace when the woman is at home. Um, there's another one. This is a woman. Okay, we're gonna we're gonna bring her together with a child. Sometimes the character z is male child. Um, it's a little bit ambiguous. I've seen all kinds of things. I I interpret it as male child. So you're like, oh, woman and son. Like maybe it means family. Um, in fact, it means good. So the word for good in Chinese is a woman with a child, or specifically a woman with a son. So you know you're growing up as like a little kid, and of course this is like being hardwired into your brain. Um, but not all characters, you know, and words that involve the female character, you know, the new radical, are like happy and peaceful and good. Sometimes they get very, uh, they get more, a little bit more sinister. So three women together means evil or wicked. <laughs> yep. Sort of like, you know, Macbeth and the three witches. When you bring three women, three women together, if you kind of look throughout hit, like literature and history, like does not end well, right? Like Heathers, all kinds of things. <laughs> so this, this word, lan, means greedy. So this word means, um, and uh, sorry, this one means slave. Um, this character means envy, and where the right half of the right, right half, right half of the character is um, means disease, and this character 
again, it means betray, treachery, or adultery. Um, so <laughs> it's kind of interesting, actually, because when I was like doing these slides, the, the female radical for um, is uh, the connotation in Chinese is the female radical, and, but on the emoji keyboard, it definitely has a male uh, connotation to it. So you can already see this kind of gender bias on the emoji keyboard. So for example, when I showed up at Unicode in 2015, there are many jobs or roles that you can have on the emoji keyboard. For example, if you're a man, you could be, um, if this is if you're a man, so you could be a cop, you could be a detective, you could be like a Buckingham Palace guard for whatever reason, and or you can be Santa Claus. But if you were a woman, there were only four roles that you could play on the emoji keyboard as of 2015. So you could be a princess, you could be a bride, you could play a dancer, or you can be a playboy bunny. Those were, those were the four things that you could be as a female um, on the emoji keyboard. And just in case you think it's like Chinese and emoji that have all of these gender issues, I mean, you should think about in English. Um, history, right? It is his story. It's not her story. It's not our story. It's not their story. It is history. So, um, you know, in, in this context, I was like, all right, we're going to fight the good fight. We're going to go, we're going to first start with our dumpling. So, I think, do I click in order to make this video play? Or does that make the thing go play? Oh, good. Okay. Dumplings are one of the most <laughs> universal cross-cultural foods in the world. Georgia has kinkali, Japan has gyoza, Korea has mandu, Italy has ravioli. Poland has pierogi, Russia has pelmeni, Argentina has empanadas, Jewish people have kreple, China has potstickers, Nepal and Tibet have momos. Yet somehow, despite their popularity, there is no dumpling emoji in the standard set. Why is that? Emoji exists for pizza, tempura, sushi, spaghetti, hot dog, and now tacos, which Taco Bell takes credit for. We need to write this disparity. Dumplings are global. Emoji are global. Isn't it time we brought them together? <laughs> oh yeah. And while we're at it, how about an emoji for Chinese takeout? Yeah. Thank you. And um, actually, <laughs> uh, the the guy the guy who did that is named Duncan Robeson, and he actually also did the enhance um, video for those of you who are in code and art. Yeah. So he can dumplings and like sinister sort of like movie tropes. So um, we basically did dumpling takeout box, fortune cookie, and chopsticks. And I have to say like. Um, I don't think Fortune Cookie would have made it on its own merit, but sort of like on, on the um, kind of coattails of dumpling and takeout box and chopsticks, it kind of got through. Um, this is Yi Ying with the uh, then co-chair of the Emoji Subcommittee, uh, who works for Apple, and therefore I will not speak his name. Um, and I, like once it hit the keyboards in the end of 2017, so in November, I was like, Billions of keyboards impacted. I mean, a little bit, but billions. Like, I could like drop the mic and like go have kids at this point. You know, so like I've left my mark on the world, 2,000 world history. And it's interesting because I actually have a female friend who's also a CEO. She's like, I don't, I don't see the point of being a mom. And like, it doesn't scale, which is a very Silicon Valley <laughs> way. <laughs> <laughs> but for every reason, we just I just kept on going with this emoji thing. You know, I realized that, that in 2017, I'm, I spent two years of my life on this dumpling emoji. Um, and so, you know, but like we just kept on going. Like we, it was just the start. So for example, we did mate emoji um, on behalf of those in the Latin America who drink the mate. I spent a long time explaining to the um, members of the subcommittee. So I got onto the emoji subcommittee, sort of whatever, through hookature, um, that it was not the same as a, a straw with cup. Um, so, you know, this is a team they flew up in order to sort of advocate for the mate emoji. We did a bunch of Chinese holidays. Um, things with the red envelope, mooncake, and firecracker. There was a sorry. Hello, Mr. Sorry. Sorry? Sorry. Okay. Sorry. Um, you know, on behalf of women uh, in India. And it's not just cultural items. We'd also do mosquito. For example, uh, this is really important because mosquitoes are the deadliest animal in the world. 700,000 uh, or so people die each year. Humans are second, 450. Uh, 450,000. Uh, hippos kill 500, and sharks kill 10 or 50. Something. It's a, it's a very, very small number. So mosquitoes are very, very clearly important. Um, and I, I had a sort of like big debate with like people on the subcommittee where they're like, well, the mosquitoes Instagram numbers aren't like that great. I'm like, are you kidding me? <laughs> Who's going to Instagram a mosquito, right? So it sort of shows the sort of bias towards like charismatic megafauna. Um, <laughs> then. 
Then there was broom. We did, I did a whole, so we discovered like there's a lot of office related emoji, right? Like even things that are defunct, like floppy disk and pagers and whatever. Nothing for household chores, nothing for cleaning, even though like a, more than half the world spends a good bit of their life cleaning. So, but the ones that were most fervent I found, uh, the proposals were from people who were trying to get emoji that looked like themselves. So this is Rayouf Al Humeidi, who is a 15, who was a 15 year old girl from, um, Germany, who is Saudi Arabian, who proposed a hijab emoji. So we got that pass. Then you see, we also heard a lot from like the redheads, you know, who really advocated. And then curly-haired people, um, and then bald people as well. They got there was a guy who really advocated for a beard, um, and it was just like it really felt like a paper doll. It was it was almost like Bitmoji-ish. So we also introduced gender-neutral emoji. Um, yeah, so which are, which are actually really important. So once we got to went to male and female you needed sort of gender neutral. And this is also why it's sort of important, because we have a lot of words in English, like doctor, student, uh, child, which don't have the gender implied. So once you start drawing using images, you build in the gender. So this is kind of why we felt it was important to have gender neutral emojis. Um, and then Apple really worked hard to get um, sort of disability related emoji, and including people who are de deaf. So um, in terms, you can have an impact. Many, many people can have an impact. Unicode, you can just sort of submit. In fact, the, the person who is responsible for the five skin tones that you see on your uh, phone is a mother from Texas, Katrina Parrott, who tried to figure out how to do this because her daughter came home wanting to do um, a thumbs up, a, a sort of a black thumbs up. And so she, she, like me, Googled, where did emoji come from? And she like proposed. Um, my, our little kind of contribution as Emoji Nation is we worked on an interracial couple emoji, which, is, which just got passed, so should be coming to your phone soon. And then, so what's, what's really been kind of interesting is this idea of, I've been watching my kids with, um, I'm sorry, I don't have kids, my friends with kids and using phones, using their emoji phone, and it's interesting because they are learning to read and write and communicate with emoji before they read and write and communicate with their written language, right? That's really interesting, right? So in, that, in terms of how it changes their brain. So as my linguist friend pointed out, like right now we're kind of communicating through emoji through in terms of like a pigeon, kind of like here eggplant, there an eggplant. But for the kids, as they grow up, as their brains are very flexible, it's a form of Creole. Um, and then it will evolve into a, a language. So languages evolve bottom up rather than top down. And I realized in talking to the linguists that what we were seeing with all the fervency of the proposals of the redheads and the curly hair and the beard and the hijab is that people were trying to say the word I, right? That in a way, um, you know, for me, like I go like this, that's, that's, that represents me. But for many other languages, um, the, the word I has now become sort of a hard reference. They were trying to describe themselves. And so in a way, I was helping billions of people say the word I. And, um, and it's kind of interesting because, you know, we talk about, you know, Black Panther and uh, Crazy Rich Asians of like seeing yourself represented on the big screen for people is really important, but seeing yourself represented on the small screen is also very important. And so, um, one of the things that we've done in the last two years is um, actually work on issues of gender, right? So Google did a bunch of uh, a proposal that diversified what the kinds of things you could be on the keyboard as a woman, so you guys should have that already. Um, I worked with a mom of three girls um, to do women's flat shoe, because all the women, um, all the shoes until that point had heels, even the sandals. Um, there she is, she's actually about to have a fourth daughter. <laughs> um, and we also did a bathing suit versus, um, to, because we felt like bikini wasn't doing it for all of us. And that did not necessarily get um, favorable reaction from all quarters. One kind of commenter said, one piece swimsuit. Why? A person wanting to indicate the use of swimwear can't use the existing bikini? Is this really necessary? What about a Victorian bathing costume or a wetsuit or water wings? Do not encode. So the man who did this, actually, you can, he's actually responsible. No, 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 no. <laughs> This is actually, he actually is from Ireland, is, it is responsible for this emoji. So he put this emoji into the set. Um, um, it is a reverse hand with middle, middle finger um, extended. But it's kind of interesting, right? Because I, we have, like, the people push back on emoji because um, it's sort of, interesting, like I also heard another guy on television being like, mango emoji, who wants a mango emoji? And like, 
you know, Jeremy Burge, who's head of Emojipedia, is like, I'm about like a third of the world would really like a mango emoji. So, but I feel like, in a way, seeing the people push back, it's sort of a failure of theory of mind. That uh, theory of mind is the idea that like you understand there are people who are not you, who have different perspectives from you. It's usually something used to describe kids who are like five, like, oh, have they just sort of achieved theory of mind? But it feels like we're sort of not achieving theory of mind in like a good subsection of our population. And that has been manifesting itself in the political discourse <laughs> of late. Um, but my, my hope is, you know, kids are seeing these things growing up. So it's a shared visual language that they're growing up with. It's curated. So it forces them to understand through the emoji keyboard that skin tones matters, that the hijab matters, that gender neutrality matters, that holidays matter, that mangoes matter, right? That by being hardwired from when they are young to understand that these are things that the world cares about, that it should give them a more inclusive understanding of the world. So that's my hope. Uh, to close the loop, uh, the boyfriend back then now has three kids, yay, held the first kid, didn't feel a sense of envy, um, <laughs> but, but really excited he has three kids. Um, our books are kind of moving forward. Uh, it's very slow, publishing, you know, 600-year history emoji, like a 20-year history, so it was easier to move emoji. So you will see some of our very high-quality fiction, hopefully, um, um, with our first cli-fi collection, which is climate change fiction. So that's our little way of changing the world. It's coming in November. And Emoji Nation was recognized in fast companies, like 50 most or 100 most creative kind of lists. But it is many, many people, um, not just me. Oops, let's see. So here, ah, let's, boop. OK, so these are some of the people who have helped uh, with Emoji Nation. Um, I also became the vice chair of the Unicode Emoji Subcommittee, kind of accidentally, somewhere along the way. Yes. So it was sort of like, come inside. Um, and so, you know, my point, my hope is that in the future, when the kids grow up and they think about the concept of envy, it is not something that they associate as a feminine quality. So thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. Oh, yeah, yes. One, <laughs> one last point. If you want to write an emoji proposal, I can send you a template. Um, so you, know, you can contact me on emojination.org with your ideas. Thank you. All right. Thank, Thank you. So you. Much. <laughs>